right. Thanks, folks, for joining in. Uh, Tom, this conference, uh, you know, I happened to start this back in 2004. We've been running this. And so over the years, you would see that, uh, you know, there are quite a few people that uh, have been part of this community, helped us build this. And, uh, you know, that's where you see a lot of these familiar names, folks who kind of come back. And I'm sure everyone uh, has been waiting uh, for this opportunity to meet you. Uh, unfortunately, not in person, but uh, you know, virtually at least. Uh, it's it's such an honor and it's such a privilege, uh, Tom, to finally uh, have you. Uh, you know, talk to talk to the Agile India community. Uh, Tom is someone that again, uh, most of us have been deeply influenced by Tom's work. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, back in like many years ago, someone gave me your uh, software metrics book because that was one of the area that I was uh, pretty keen on in terms of measuring, uh, you know, what we are doing and when we are trying to, oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this has been such a such an instrumental book, uh, Tom, uh, in, in, uh, in, in a lot of work that we do. In fact, uh, even just the uh, a few months ago, there's a bit of an open source project that I built where we try and uh, you know measure some of the uh, uh, some of these metrics in in there from the book as well. Uh, and I was referring to like this this work is uh, is is before I was born. <laughs> this work was done <laughs> before I was born, uh, which is pretty cool, right? So. Uh, and I, I think you you can also talk about uh, some of your work with uh, with the Indian government and Tata and your uh, role you played in CMM four. Uh, so you know again I think it's just a great honor to have you, Tom, and looking forward to uh, to your talk. And uh, without much delay, I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Tom. Right. So here is our uh, title. Uh, agile engineering. So I'm going to try to put the engineering in agile because it's not there yet. And uh, we don't need engineering for very simple, small projects, uh, but we need engineering for the large, complex ones that are facing almost everybody. I have about 37 slides. I'm going to go at a, obviously a pace of about one slide a minute. And many of my slides have a lot of detail in them. And you will not have time, and I will not have time to go through the slides in detail. So I will present a highlight. And if it interests you, you can go back and get a copy of the slides and uh, study them uh, uh, later. And you will find very many free books and papers to allow you to go into more depth in the subjects that interest you. Uh, I have a photo of me with the uh, early uh, uh, books from 76 and 88, and they both contain considerable agile information. I'll give you a sample in a moment, but um, the uh, uh, we didn't call it agile. Uh, for many a quarter of a century, we called it evolutionary delivery. Even the U.S. Department of Defense called it that and had special standards for it. So, but uh, agile is the popular term that the, my friends uh, agreed on. Okay, uh, if you um, want a copy of the slides, you'll find them at the conference site. You'll also find them here. Uh, and if you want my what I call my agile library, this is a collection of very many things that I've written, uh, papers and talks mostly, but videos on agile. You can use this uh, QR to get a hold of it. So uh, I couldn't resist putting this picture uh, in. Sorry, one picture too many. Uh, I think, okay, well, <laughs> better not touch it. There, there's a picture of uh, me at my son, Kai, who lectured at uh, Agile India recently, uh, his uh, wedding at uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar's ashram in Bangalore. And uh, my wife and I and my older son are also in uh, Indian costume. 
And uh, shortly after the wedding, I went to an IT conference in uh, Bangalore and everybody had to have a picture with me because I was so tall. And I, they said, Tom, you look like Indian prince. So I consider myself an amateur Indian prince. Okay, here's the agenda, about 16 subjects, about 45 uh, minutes. And uh, uh, we, um, and then there's also the link to the Agile library there. Okay, so I'm, I would like to quote to you from the um, uh, 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 software metrics book, the US edition came out in 77, um, and uh, from page 214. And I'm quite proud of what was there because I think it not only defines agile, but it defines agile as it should be and is not. That is, there is some engineering here. A complex system, which is what we're interested in for engineering, will be most successful if it is implemented in small steps. No surprise, that's the basic idea that everybody agrees to with Agile, small steps. And if each step has a clear measure, okay, metrics, measurement, software metrics book, engineering, a clear measure of successful achievement. For example, if we're trying, our project is trying to enhance the security of the system, we should be measuring security increases at every sprint. Got it? Do you do things like that? And I add, as well as a retreat possibility to a previous successful step, upon failure. So a step can fail, but we need to be able to retreat and go back. So uh, th this is also my recipe for always being successful and never failing on a large scale. So next, yeah. So my first point is there is far too much emphasis on coding and being a coder and writing code as the environment for Agile. And I think there are a lot of other things we have to worry about. Uh, we have to worry about the data and the databases. We have to worry about the people uh, using the system, customers of the system and the other stakeholders. We have to worry about the hardware. We have to worry about, I have a special name for programmers, soft crafters not software engineers. They're not engineers. They are craftspeople. I hope they are very good craftspeople, but they are soft crafters. And uh, 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 plumbers and electricians do not make a skyscraper of 100 stories. Engineers and architects do, okay? And there is even uh, legal things, laws we have to respect. Uh, 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 plans we have to respect and cultures we have to respect. So there's just a whole lot of things more than the logic where, more than the code. And, we, and I, what I see is everybody is thinking about the code and writing the code and things like that. They're thinking like soft crafters, programmers, but they're not thinking about the systems, okay? So we need systems level thinking, even if our main job is programming and our main interest is the code, somebody, let's call them the systems engineer, the project manager, there, uh, there is no word for this at all in things like uh, Scrum. Uh, product owner really is nowhere near this case you wonder, take a look at the description. We need somebody, to manage the system, let's call them a product owner, and to architect the system, let's call them the systems architect. And in fact, we need to do what is called systems uh, engineering. Point number three of 15, stakeholders. And I'll get back to this uh, later, but uh, 
let me give you a little, uh, uh, first a definition. Stakeholders are anybody or anything which has a requirement for your system, okay? So a law which says you must protect privacy is a stakeholder. It's not a person, but it has a requirement for you. So here is a long list uh, of uh, stakeholders. <coughs> Every medium and large scale project has at least this many critical stakeholders. Critical means if you don't make them happy, they can kill your entire system. They can make it illegal. They can make it so nobody can buy it or use it, okay? So I believe we need to uh, move away from users and customers and user stories as too little. And we need to move over to stakeholder experience, not user experience. Stakeholder stories, not user stories. We need to, this is part of being a systems engineer. We need to take into consideration all those factors which determine whether we succeed or fail. If we only look at the code, we fail. Look at the failure rates. Google uh, Agile failure rates, Standish Group, for example, and you find horrendously high failure rates due to, in my opinion, not using these engineering methods and being too much of a programmer and too little of an engineer. Notice something else here. Many stakeholders, many qualities or values, I call them. These are stakeholder values. These are the top 10 critical ones. They're all quantified in my world. These are the costs. For example, uh, future maintenance costs, not just capital costs. And these are the top level architecture or strategies. And each one of these is related to one or more qualities, is related to one or more costs. Is and the qualities is what we're delivering back to the stakeholders, okay? The qualities are the values that the stakeholders have. So it's a pretty complex picture and we're using an app or a tool to keep track of it here called uh, Valplan. Point number four. I believe we uh, have to think in terms of the cost effectiveness of our systems. Now, effectiveness, that's for me, multiple values, the security, the privacy, the performance, the usability, multiple values at the same time. And then there are multiple costs, money now, money later time and effort now and later, okay? And in a way, there's a little equation here we can call uh, efficiency. And uh, it is the sum of all of these values, what we're giving to our stakeholders over the sum of all the costs types, all the resources. And we, uh, in particular, our architects need to be looking at the value to cost ratio, the architecture. Here is a chapter uh, in, uh, in, in a book I've written. I'll give you a copy of that free, but there's a, a, a video going into this point more deeply. Now, this slide. Do you have an agile method that can handle 10 top objectives quantified and five costs at the same time. No, I don't think you do. Here is a tool called an impact estimation table. It's in my books. It's in, uh, you, you can, uh, if you're interested, you can read about it, but it's a tool. It's basically a spreadsheet, but on this axis, we have any number of critical values or qualities, which are quantified here is how bad we are, this number. Here's how good we want to be in the future. Here is a set of architecture, strategies, solutions, designs, call them what you want, but they're the things we're going to do in our system and build or acquire in our system, which if we do, will give us some 
more of this value and 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 more of this value. And it will consume some of this cost and some of this cost, okay? So here is actually a numeric way of looking at the multiple values of any design or architecture towards any set of quantified critical values or qualities with respect to any set of long-term, short-term costs, people, time, money. And using these numbers, we can actually compute the values to cost ratio. And we can point out the, the number here is the highest value to cost ratio. And in fact, the highest value to cost ratio is a good way of prioritizing and saying, we will do this strategy first in the first sprints because it will give us the most values for the least costs. Got it? Here's a way of simplifying this table and simply bar chart. There's the sum of the uh, values and there's the sum of the costs. And these are different four different architectures being compared. I hope some of you, if you get nothing, you get this idea of the impact estimation table as a way of modeling complex systems and a way of engineering them. Okay. Point number six. Do you have an enterprise architect? Some of you do, many of you don't. It's not really a part of agile, is it? It's part of uh, large scale uh, systems development, okay? Now, in, in this case, I'm pointing to a case study from IBM Systems Journal, from IBM Federal Systems Division, and they had a problem. And some of you have the same problem. They had a fixed price contract with NASA or US Department of Defense for some software, for maybe a ship or a rocket ship. And uh, they had a fixed deadline for delivering it. And they had very high qualities for defense and space, the highest that were attainable. And every time they took such a contract, they lost money, they delivered late, and they had problems with the quality. So IBM went to the smartest guy in the room, one Hardin Mills, I call him the Leonardo da Vinci of software engineering, and said, Harlan, can you solve this problem? Can you always deliver on time, under budget, so we make money, the highest qualities for the largest, most complex uh, software systems? And Harlan said, I'll try. And he, he spent years uh, doing what is called the clean room method. You can look it up, you can get books on it, et cetera. And now the, the one point I'm gonna, and they achieved that. They achieved years on end, always on time. Imagine that, always under the fixed price budget. So they made money. Imagine that, always delivering the highest qualities. Imagine that. Most people don't know how to do that, but this was, decades ago and reported in the IBM Systems Journal. Here is a link to the detail down here. Now, I'm, I'm gonna make a very simple point here. The way they did it was none of the ways that are being taught in Agile today at all. What they did, but this is Agile. The, their loop to deliver a uh, Navy system was 40, uh, five increments, in other words, 2% increments, okay? Now, after every increment, they asked, uh, are we, uh, is the quality that we want, like availability of the system, is that going up towards 99.98% that we are supposed to deliver? Yes or no? If no, and we expected it to go up, call in Bob Quinnen, the architect, <clears throat> and say, Bob, you have to fix your architecture right now before we do the next sprint. And you have to make it more effective so that we uh, can, can reach our architecture uh, quality levels on, uh, on time. Or if, for example, if uh, the well, one month sprint took two months, then they brought in Quinnen and said, redesign the architecture so it only takes 
one month. Okay. In other words, they made up to 45 adjustments in between sprints based on numeric feedback in relation to their numeric goals. And these adjustments allowed them finally to be on time, under budget, every time with the highest quality space and military systems. This should be taught in all universities for all large projects and certainly for software, but it is not. The professors don't teach it. They were never taught it. They don't know about it. And this is the best agile method in the world, except Mr. Musk, as I will talk to you at the end, has also um, taken into use basically the same methods for SpaceX and Tesla. Here's just a, another one. This is the, they use the same iterative process to build the initial architecture as a series of steps until they think they have a good starting architecture before they do their sprints. Point number seven, um, one of the largest uh, adopters of my methods, my planning language or language, which quantifies the qualities and has the impact estimation table is Intel. They have been doing uh, my methods corporate wide with over 20,000 engineers for 20 years successfully. Uh, one man there, Mr. Terzakis, likes to do research on my methods as they're used in practice at Intel. So here's a research paper you can all have. And uh, I'll give you just this one idea. So first, they, they know that a primary source of problems is badly written requirements, which then get to the architect, which then does the wrong architecture. And so uh, basically, they do... Uh, my quality control method, specification quality control, okay, which is a simplified form of the inspection method. Uh, and uh, they apply it to my planning language specifications, which they teach everybody on a two day course. Anyway, so a group comes with a 31 page requirement document and they find 312 defects. These are violations of the rules of the standards. Uh, in simple terms, those standards say, the requirements must be crystal clear, numeric, no fluffiness, okay? And this means there are 10 major defects per page. Page is 600 words, not bad, actually quite good, because language forces you to have a good level to start with. But it turns out that Intel has calculated that they need to have a level of 0.2 two per 600 words maximum. Otherwise, it doesn't pay off to go into architecture and design chips. So what they do is they say, no exit. Your, your uh, uh, um, requirements aren't good enough. And the team tries again and again and again and again. And finally, this could be some weeks later, a 45-page requirements with only 10 defects, in other words, 0.22, gets exit, meaning it can be used for other purposes. It can go to the architect. By the way, they have now reduced 98% of the incoming defects that were here in the first one. Okay, So this is a practical example of using my engineering methods in a very good engineering corporation, Intel. And there are more other corporations like Boeing and Hewlett Packard, I could name right away. You will find case studies of my clients succeeding with the methods in the books I'm giving you for free. Point number eight. Uh, now, in a way, I already went through this, but maybe an enlarged version. So here we have the impact estimation table. Here we have different architectures. But in this case, we're going to consider the architectures to be possible sprint deliveries, possible increments, okay? And what we're trying to do is estimate how good is this uh, architecture for this particular goal. And the answer is it gets us 50% of the way towards the goal. In other words, halfway between 50 and 90% of the numeric goal. 
And uh, the same architecture has a beautiful side effect. It gets us 57% of the way towards this goal. And it gets us 53% of the way towards this goal. And it gets, uh, et cetera, you see it. So, wow, that's a really good design or architecture. Have you ever thought how to really evaluate a design? <coughs> this is how. You have to numerically say how good it will be and later measure how good it is in relation to your critical quantified objectives. As you know, the agile we know today doesn't try to do this at all. It is not engineering and it does fail too often. And we've got to stop this failure by becoming agile engineers. You've got some great engineering universities in India. Maybe they should start teaching agile engineering and I hope I'm talking to some of the professors right now, and I will help you with written materials and slides and any way you would like to make the transition to teaching these ideas in India if you just ask, okay? So, uh, yeah. And then here we have the rating of the costs, and here we have the computation. And green means this has the best values for money, Therefore, we should, if we're smart, we should do this first. We should do this early. And even if it's a little bit disappointing, maybe it won't be so bad. If you take a disappointing one and it's disappointing, maybe it's terrible. Point number nine, in simple terms, it's time we stop doing kid stuff with yellow sticky culture, it's time we digitized our thinking, as I've just shown you examples of, uh, digitized our planning for our agile systems and our, our management of the projects. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, uh, my, I am working with, investing in, and my methods are being used in next generation artificial intelligence uh, using ontology, semantic triples, the solid standard from Tim Berners-Lee, Web 3.0. And uh, uh, I hope we can say bye-bye, yellow stickies. Those are for kids in their sandbox for small projects, no problem, but the large projects, not good enough. Go to graphmetrics.com and take a look at that. Number 10. Meet my friend Eric Simmons. He's the man who spread my methods for 20 years at Intel. He personally developed the courses, taught the people, coached them, and uh, also uh, just made sure it worked in practice. Uh, he also wrote the foreword to the competitive engineering book. Now, he and I had a little conversation about scaling up agile. And I said, I don't like SAFE. I think SAFE is terrible, badly thought out, uh, chaotic method. And, uh, and I think my methods already scale up better. And he replied to me in writing, here it is. He said, Tom, your methods don't need uh, to scale up because they are scale free. They all, and we have proven this on small and large projects at Intel in practice for 20 years, okay? Wow, I didn't think about it that way. Now I'm writing a new book. Here's the, the link to, I'm in the middle of writing it. It's called Simple, okay? And we have a special chapter there on scaling where I've tried to work out the theory of why are some methods scale-free? They work at any scale. And why are some methods not? And the simple answer is what I call black box theory. Methods that look outside the black box, no matter how big and complex the inside of the black box are, will work at any scale. I wonder if some of you picked up the idea. Anyway, read of the, the black box theory of scaling uh, of methods in my new simple book. And you can follow the writing of that book in the next few weeks, I hope to finish it. Number 11, here's just a practical example. This is the same uh, uh, impact estimation table. 
in use at a very small uh, company of total 67 people, but operating on the international market with uh, media uh, software. And uh, development staff is 13 programmers and three uh, uh, and, uh, uh, testers. And they've divided their people, about 16 people, into four four-person teams. Each team takes a quantified set, in this case, very many usability things, but here's some testability and backwards compatibility. They take some quantified goals, here's the quantification, and they work on them for a quarter of a year in weekly increments. And they measure cumulatively how far they have gotten. This is actually week nine of 12, so they've got 67% of this, 100% of this, 107% of this one. And then based on this feedback, they decide which goal they're going to work on. Usually the weakest ones, like here's a zero, here's a 10. So we need to work on those. This is dynamic prioritization. And they achieve by the end of their deadline, which is the quarterly release of the software to the world, they achieve ext uh, extremely high qualities on uh, in about 20 areas. In the first year of the use of this method, they uh, blew away all their international competition. They wiped them out and bought them up and, and succeeded on the market. And they directly credited on their website in public our Evo method. This is just simple proof that even on small scale, agile engineering also works. You can read the detailed case study there. So 12 principles of agile engineering. Now, uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? We've got to be, uh, let's see, here we go. And I'm going to look at my watch. Yeah, okay. So we're we're pretty good on time. We have um, yeah, I, I have an alarm going in about ten minutes, uh, end of the forty-five minutes, and then we have a little bit of leeway here. But okay. So uh, this is from a book called Value Agile, and here is your free copy. Here are some slides on it, and here is even a video of me explaining Value Agile or agile as it should be, okay? And here are the basic principles. Now, actually, I've been through these principles in my earlier part of the talk, so I can save time, but I have condensed the basic idea into these 10 basic ideas. And these are the basic ideas then of agile uh, engineering. Um, I've been engaged with a group called Essence, with Ivar Jakobsen, who invented uh, uh, URL and other things. And uh, he, in his old age, he decided to become uh, an idealist or do what you Indians call seva, okay? And me too. I'm 81 years old, okay? And I'm going to do, seva is when I'm sharing my ideas with you. And Ivar got a great idea. He said, let's stop the agile wars of my method is best, get certified in my method, pay me. He said, this is silly. Let's have a library called Essence and let all those who will donate their methods give their methods for free to everybody in India and everybody everywhere else. So for example, Scrum has done this, okay? Jeff Sutherland, he's on board there. I have done this. And so I've taken all my methods and I wrote a special booklet. You can have a copy of it called Simplan. And uh, actually, I'm having a meeting uh, uh, later this evening with the people who are moving my ideas, which are organized in this book, over to Essence. So it's in progress now. But uh, if you like, this book is a way of uh, pick and choose uh, any of the 100 micro apps. And you can bring it into your method without changing your method, okay? One idea at a time. If it works for you, it's good and it's free. And 
you know, bring your own method. Okay. Now, point 14 out of 15, not too bad. Uh, stakeholder again. So I have a, uh, I, I finally did what I'd been promising myself to do for years. Last year, I wrote the stakeholder engineering uh, book, which is, uh, um, how many pages is it? It's a lot, 170 pages or something like that. Here is, uh, are the principles of stakeholder engineering, okay? One of them is the stakeholders are so many and so complex that you really need digital tools, not yellow stickies, to keep track of them. And you need a very clear definition of who that stakeholder is and what values they hold. And you need numeric information. How much security do they want and when do they want it? That's numeric information about the stakeholder values, et cetera. Again, if you want my one page summary about stakeholders, here it is, okay? Uh, nice little diagram where I analyze stakeholders in relation to threats and security. No more time for that. And so we have uh, Musk's methods. Now, um, about uh, a year ago, uh, Musk did a star-based tour. And during that tour, he said, this is my, I have five principles. And Here's my number one, two, three, four, five principles. And I thought, wow, Musk hasn't yet written his methods book, but uh, I could, uh, th uh, this was then written down. Uh, I made my own notes, but the guy with the uh, video made his notes. And we finally wrote down Musk's five principles, okay? And here they are. And uh, I like Musk's principles because, well, because they're the same as my principles, right? But he has some fun principles. For example, requirements are wrong. It doesn't matter who gave them to you, like your customer in Europe or something like that. He says it's particularly dangerous even if an intelligent person like Elon Musk gave you the requirements because you might not question them and say maybe they could be improved. Everyone's wrong, even Elon Musk. All designs are wrong, even Elon Musk's. It's just a matter of how wrong. Wow, wow, wow. And there's more here, right? By the way, he ends up with everyone should be a chief engineer. What does he mean? He means the same as I started this talk with. Everyone should understand the larger system and how it all hangs together, like Musk does when he works in detail. Okay, so he um, uh, uh, here is just a reminder that the, the principles of Musk are, as far as I can see, the same as I'm trying to encourage you, my, my uh, language ideas. And I think Musk is the greatest agile practitioner of all. I think, forget me, forget my ideas. Don't read my book. Read Musk's Methods book which I give you for free. Now, I rewrote his, because he was just spouting off orally while walking around his, his uh, spaceships, but I rewrote to make it clearer what I think Musk means, and I detailed. Here's the detail on the requirements. Here's a, requ uh, a language requirement in detail, quantified, okay? And uh, I, I rewrote uh, the design, I rewrote the dynamic optimization. I rewrote Accelerate. Here's a fun picture. Here's the uh, chairman of Volkswagen being jealous that Musk in his German factory will go three times faster pushing the cars out than they even dream about at Volkswagen. Not bad for a beginner because I believe Volkswagen's been at it since the I before I was born. He's pretty good. These principles work, okay? Automate, but as some of you know, uh, in the, for the um, Tesla Model 3, Musk uh, uh, automated too much too fast, and he had to go back and systematically work his way up to automation or not automate. Very interesting study. I, I drive uh, uh, the Tesla Model 3, 
for one year now, it is perfect. I've not had a single fault in it. Not bad for an automobile. I wonder how the Indian automobiles compare in quality. So, uh, yeah, here's this idea of focusing on the big picture. Some of his young employees were encouraged to uh, do that, focus on the vision of, uh, well, getting to Mars or something like that. Okay. Here's something else that's a li little known. Musk is actually fanatic on safety of the passengers in the cars and safety for people. Uh, and uh, here are the 50 safest rated cars in the world. And Model 3, Model S, and Model X are the three safest cars in the world. How does he do that? He doesn't do it by testing and debugging. He does it by, okay, there's my 45 minutes thing there. I'll put it on snooze. That gives me nine minutes if I need it, but I won't. So uh, Musk hires the smartest safety engineer he can find and says, I don't want you to merely meet the safety standards of California. I want you to design the safest car ever built. Would you like to work here instead of for that stupid General Motors you're working for now? And the ambitious young architect says, I want to work for you. I want to design the safest car in the world. And they did it. In other words, they they do it, they do it through architecture, through design, through engineering. They don't debug a bad car after it's rolled off. That's what we are still doing in software. We are testing and debugging bad software rather than designing the software to not have bugs in it. That would be called the defect prevention process, which you'll find I've written about. So engineering is complex. Some of you will be a little bit overwhelmed with what I've presented. Some of you will say, this is not for me. I just want to go back to my coding. Sorry about that. I hope there are a few of you leaders in teaching and in your companies that said, this is for us. This is an agenda for India. We will lead the world in software engineering. We will take in the, into use these ideas before most people outside of India have woken up to the idea. You still have a chance, okay? So here's the book I'm working on, simple, free copy. There it is. And uh, uh, recently we made an attempt to simplify. Uh, we, Al Shalloway and I, were talking about the iron tri triangle and getting very unhappy about it. So we, def we defined a five, a, a penta with five notions where we brought in things that are not in the iron triangle, like the idea of designs, the idea of quantified values, the idea of efficiency that I talked uh, earlier, and the idea of far more resources than simple money and time. So if you like, this is an ex uh, the definitions of all these are right here. But if you like, this is my new simplified model of software and systems engineering. And it's quite fresh. We, we invented the whole thing from scratch, just getting angry at iron, uh, iron triangles. And there are comments about that in August uh, this year. So now I'm done with my presentation. Oh, here's another free book. If you absolutely insist, um, uh, everybody talks about complex and, and complicated systems. And I believe the problem is not that the systems are complex or complicated. I believe we don't have the tools to see and understand them. And I put all 100 such tools in a little book called Technoscopes, which in fact are engineering tools for looking in at the black box and understanding what is inside. So in other words, I do not believe in the theories that uh, of complexity and uh, complication is a problem. The problem is us. We don't have the tools to see complex systems and understand them. So that was my talk. Oops, go back a slide. But these are, so here's a reminder we did. And we then, um, do we have, a, how many more minutes do we have for questions? Go ahead.
Yeah, I think uh, first of all, thanks a lot, uh, Tom. Uh, that was amazing. I didn't realize we ran out of the 45 minutes so quickly. Uh, I wish this lasted a little longer, uh, but I'm sure you'll be in the Hangout table and uh, you know your knowledge is accessible through all the links you've provided. Greatly appreciate. First of all, I, I think I'm quite amazed how uh, you've taken care of your stakeholders by putting these uh, QR codes <laughs> so people can scan and get access to this very easily. I thought that was very thoughtful. Uh, you know, what I think uh, uh, that you know other folks can kind of copy. Uh, cool. I think uh, again, I can I can go on and uh, talk about everything I got out of this talk. But I think there are a few questions we should uh, get to. Uh, so I'll kind of quickly jump straight to it, uh, Tom, if you're okay with that. Yes, go ahead. Cool. I think we could stop sharing your slides so people can see you full screen. Well, the one question I saw it was give me an example of language. Yes, yes. So well, then to answer the question, I need the slide. So I move back uh, to one slide. Here is an example of the planning language, language, which I started inventing in my software metrics book, 1976. So I've been doing it for about 50 years. This is the language which Intel has adopted, for example. And uh, so here is uh, one requirement of a value. Here is a statement of the ambition level. This is what we call the bullshit level. It's, uh, it's almost the same as user stories, by the way. Then we go to engineering. We say, def define a scale of measure. That's the big trick. And I teach this in my book. So here is a uh, defined, I don't just say the car is fast. I say, we will use miles per hour or kilometers per hour as a scale of measure, okay? And then I say, when we will measure it with the speedometer on the car, or maybe the police will measure with a radar system. That's the meter specification. Then who are the stakeholders who care about this? United Nations Children's Fund, et cetera. And what is the status at the moment? We are at uh, 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 50 on the scale. And what is the goal? We wish to increase from 50% to at least uh, 95% by 2019 in this case. But that was then. Okay, so here is a, here's a practical example of a value or quality requirement using language. Now, uh, the, uh, this is also language. This is the sum of values uh, 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 versus the sum of costs for different architecture. That is language. Here, I showed you the simple example using a simple spreadsheet of uh, the small company. Uh, uh, they are looking at one design on Sprint 9 and estimating it will uh, 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 give us 50% of this goal. And uh, they uh, uh, actually achieve 95%. That's the feedback and measurement. This is language in that particular example. Uh, I showed you a few more impact estimation tables. That is language. So uh, in a way, uh, so the, uh, and then of course, all of the free books I've offered to you, in, uh, including the competitive engineering book, whoopsie, yeah, competitive engineering book has a cover that looks like this. Here is uh, the book. And you can, uh, by the way, there is an Indian edition of the competitive engineering book for only 400 rupees or something like that. So if you want a paper copy cheap in India, you can get it but I'm also offering the PDF absolutely free in this set of slides. And the, the competitive engineering book is 500 pages with language. It defines language. So that's the answer to that question. Great, all right. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, I think we have a few more questions, so I'll quickly go over here. We have Ankit uh, Agarwal. So Ankit uh, is... Uh, basically saying uh, fascinating talk, more than what I was anticipated. 
this uh, the question uh, basically here is how does one change the mindset to question owns belief that i may not know everything okay changing mindset is difficult i've been trying for 50 years and i succeed some places like intel and hewlett packard very mature motivated companies i also succeeded with my friends at tata consultancy services and there's a story about that on the second slide okay so some very smart indians have received them but most of the world doesn't know about these methods they don't try to do the methods they're not motivated why not uh, there's a long answer to this question. I'll give the short one. You get people get paid for failure and for delivering bad systems. Why should they change? What if you never got paid unless it were delivered to the highest quality on time under budget? Maybe you would be motivated to use these methods then if they help you. So, so the long story is short. People are not motivated to change to better methods. And the, the world allows them to use the ridiculously bad agile methods they are currently using and still get paid for it. Somebody has to get smart and stop paying for failures and delays and bad quality. And then people say, but how are we going to get paid? And somebody said, Oh, Tom held a talk at Agile India and said he thinks he knows the answer. Let's try. And those who have tried my methods, like Intel, Hewlett Packard, Boeing, IBM, and TCS, have succeeded. Awesome. All right. Uh, one quick question uh, from me, Tom. Uh, I think uh, you referred many times in your talk the importance of having uh, you know really uh, smart people really good people in, uh, you know i think you also talked about how musk uses uh, high, tries to hire the best uh, engineers uh, what is your advice to anyone who is trying to build a team and is looking for hiring the best people how how would you uh, suggest they go about it I, uh, I think smart people know smart people. And I know India has a hell of a lot of smart people. They're not difficult to find, okay? Now, if you give smart people bad tools, they'll do bad work. One test might be at the interview, you give them my competitive engineering book for free, and you say, come back for a follow-on interview and tell me what you think of this book. If they come back and say, I think it's great ideas, we should do them, then I would recommend you hire the people. If they come back and say, this is too difficult, I like Scrum or I like Safe, then I think they are not smart people and you should not hire them. That's a great litmus test <laughs> to, to figure out who to hire. Appreciate that. All right, I think... Uh... Oh, and, and by the way, we could. that was a little bit self-serving. Hey, give them the Musk Methods book. And if they come back and say, I love these Musk Methods, hire them. Sure. <laughs> awesome way to recruit people, Balaji says. So that's great. Uh, all right. I think uh, what I'll do is we're just a little out of time. So, uh, Tom, if you don't mind, uh, we can move over to the Hangout table. But uh, before we do that, I just want to thank all the uh, participants for joining in today. Uh, and I want to uh, thank Tom for this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful, insightful talk. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. One thing, uh, for people who don't get their questions in, I have an email, tom at gilb.com, and I invite you, no charge, to ask me questions and have discussions anytime. Be my guest. You would be amazed how quickly Tom responds. <laughs> Trust me on that. 